for joining us here on DIY for Business. It's Russ and Greg with you. Greg, welcome back, or I guess I should say aloha. Aloha. I am back from, uh, you know, <laughs> the I was going to say the beautiful island of Hawaii, and obviously uh, uh, the right. island of Maui, I should say specifically, and, and Maui is a gorgeous island, but I'm sure many of our listeners have heard on the news that uh, there's some devastating fires and we narrowly escaped the fires we were planning on leaving the island of maui on the day that the fire started and it's just mm. oh it's just a, a sobering story because there were so many people we met so many places that we went that are just no longer there i mean uh, unfortunately yeah. we you know we have friends that um they lost their homes it's just it's just devastating hearing the news yeah i mean looking at the photos it seems like it's just the whole city of lahaina right the lahaina town or it is, is lahaina yeah. yeah yeah it's just gone i mean it's it's just complete devastation all the way to the water just buildings just gone and then i i went and i looked at it on google earth and seeing like you know how beautiful it was and all these amazing buildings and all these cool shops and just gone i mean it's yeah it, it must be even more dramatic for you just being there just days before we were there the day of and a lot of people have told us that we were probably one of the last people to ever see lahaina the way lahaina used to be now because it's going to have to get rebuilt it's you know you were yeah. saying that it, it burned all the way down to the water it actually burned into the water the harbor wow. is burnt down and you find some of the boats that were at the harbor floating on fire is wow. crazy and people were trying to escape the fires by actually jumping into the ocean and we've heard stories of people just floating in the ocean for hours waiting to be rescued and unfortunately yeah. a lot of them didn't make it yeah yeah i mean the death toll uh is way it's in the triple than, digits uh, now yeah it's in the triple yeah. digits and they're expecting yeah. it to just continue to go up because i believe there's close to a thousand people still missing well, that, that's the thing. I mean, the, the amount of people that are missing is is up there. And and you look at this devastation and how, like, just how fast these things spread. I, You know, here in California, we had it up in, uh, uh, in the North Bay of uh, the, the Bay Area in California. Um, and those fires just spread so fast that people had seconds to get out. Not minutes, but seconds to uh, well, think, get out of their house. Well, think about what happened in Maui was the um, Hurricane Dora was actually passing the island probably, you know, a few hundred miles off the shore of Hawaii. But the winds were 85 miles an hour on Maui when the fire started. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine the firefighters trying to control a fire with 85 mile an hour winds, and they weren't expecting yeah. it. The other thing that right. was crazy about the whole situation is internet and cell service um, was completely down. So there was no communication. Oh, jeez. There was no communication. Wow. So the place that we were staying at was literally minutes away from Lahaina, and they had no idea of what was going on in Lahaina. Wow. So you, did you have, when was your first indication of, of this going on? So the fire started Tuesday morning around nine o'clock because of the storm. Actually, there was no um, power in the resort that we were at when I woke up that morning and I realized, mm -hmm. okay, something's going on. Right. So I went down to the lobby and I heard, yeah, power's out all of Western Maui. And there was a little fire going on in Lahaina. It was a little fire at the time and they thought they had it controlled. But when I realized we didn't have internet and we didn't have GPS, I go, okay, this is kind of bad. We need to pack up and get out of here as soon as possible. The crazy thing about it, there was no uh, cell service except my wife somehow got GPS to work for a split second and it told us an alternative route to get back to oh, the airport wow. that was not going through Lahaina because most people oh. had to go through Lahaina. Well, if we mm -hmm. went that way and got stuck in the traffic, the fires would have got us. Wow. But we took this one lane road up around the north of Maui that literally is one lane going for both directions right you have to kind of swerve off the side of the road to let somebody buy you it's a crazy drive but it got us out of there and we heard literally within an hour after we got through there 
they close the road because that road can't handle traffic. Right. So well, people, and you see people area, on, yeah, you see people on the road that's all congested. I, I, I know what you're talking about because they showed it on, on the TV here. Yeah. It's great. So the other surreal thing that, that, yeah, the other surreal thing about this is, you know me, I'm a business guy, right? I'm talking business. Well, even on vacation, I'm downtown Lahaina. I'm talking to um, a business owner and he told me that he's just started franchising his business, uh, you know, into California. And I'm talking to him about that. Well, he had two locations in Lahaina that are gone now. I saw his post online and they're mm. completely gone. And it really made me think. Like, like you said, the whole town of Lahaina is gone. All the, you know, beautiful businesses, restaurants, they're all gone. I think there's going to be some serious conversation. Should I rebuild? Should I do this again or, you know, start somewhere new? And I right. think, that, you know, that they're going to need advice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on where you are. Like there's so many different decisions that I'm sure that are going through the business owner's minds. Like how do I restart? Like, do I want to do this again? And then you've got that sort of drive to, you know, of like, okay, we, we've got to rebuild. We've got to do this and I've got to get it done. Like some people will have that. It, it's, it's such a wide variety of emotions. I'm sure that are going through the business owner's heads there. That, yeah. I think, I, mean, I think uh, a lot of people are going to need a sounding board. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, good, good segue. I wasn't sure how we were going to do that. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've got our guest today, uh, Phil Frazier. Uh, Phil, thank you for joining us today. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank yeah, you so, for uh, joining us. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little about yourself. Um, okay, so uh, back in 2000, I accidentally uh, launched an online business with my wife, uh, no investment, kitchen table startup, uh, took us five years to get our first member of staff and an office, and then 18 years after launching, we sold to a public limited company. Um, that's the brief story. Um, <laughs> since okay. then, that was about five years ago. Since then, I've been working as what I call a business sounding board sort of halfway between a business coach and a business mentor, working with SME business owners to, to be their, their sounding board, to be their, their ears and eyes and, and somebody to just sit down with and go, hey, Phil, I've got this idea. Does this sound daft? Um, I'm thinking of doing this. Which way do you think I should go? I don't really feel like I know what I'm doing. Can you help me? All the sort of things that, you know, it's great running your own business, but it's also lonely at the top. And, and what I try to do is make it not, not lonely at the top. Yeah. yeah and what, one of yeah. our taglines is you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so right. we are right. definitely in the same boat trying to support the, the small and medium-sized business owner and, and kind of helping them through the journey. It's, it is a journey. And there's so many things that are going to be thrown your way. I kind of threw out the scenario that's happening right now in, in Maui and in Lahaina. Like when, as a sounding board, you know, where do you start with a business owner? What types of things do you try to find out about their idea, about their business to kind of help them uh, understand whether, you know, they're on the right path and where they need to go? Um, I think it's, there's two ways it, it, it works with me. Either a client will come to me with a specific problem uh, that they want me to help them solve. Or just they've got to, you know, there's an old saying, you know, what got you here won't get you there. You know, I want to get to the next stage. I don't know how to. And I always start with um, what on the surface of it sounds like a really simple question, but, but opens up so many different options. And I always start with what does perfect look like in one year's time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So simple okay. question. You go, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, and, 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 once you start thinking about it, you think, well, okay, what do I want in a year's time? You know, it might be, you know, I want to double sales or I want to double profit or I want to sell the business or I want to buy a competitor. And as soon as people start talking about what perfect looks like in a year's time, you've then got a, a, an end point for the start of your strategy. And we can then start putting things in place to make that happen. Um, it's, it's very much, it comes, you know, I'm a great, what am I, you know, the business book I tell everybody to read is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. And one of Stephen right. Covey's Seven Habits is start with the end in mind. And that's what it's based on. So uh, 
uh, I, I got to hear more about this uh, this uh, business that you did. Uh, accidental business. What, what do you mean <laughs> yeah. by that? Tell, tell us more about that. Before. <laughs> okay, so um, I ended up uh, sort of my last real job as an employee. I ended up at a, a sports betting company in the UK called William Hill. Who you, you may have heard of in the US. And we came across the concept of online bingo. This is when the online gaming market started. Um, and while I was there, they asked me to do a presentation to the board about whether the company should get into online bingo. The board decided not to. Um, I left the business at the end of that year. Um, long story short, I thought, actually, there's, there's some legs in this. Because at the time, online bingo was only a product in the US. It wasn't in the UK. So I put together... I sort of reshuffled this business plan they I'd presented to the board and took it out to the market proper. You got, you guys call it Shark Tank. We call it uh, Dragon's Den. You know, real world Shark Tank with my with my idea to be what would have been the UK's first ever pay to play online bingo site to get funding, uh, and I got nothing. I got absolutely zero, no funding whatsoever. But what I'd done is I'd built a very basic website uh, that listed all the, the US bingo sites that were in the market at the time. There's about a dozen of them. And on there, I put a very simple pop-up questionnaire so that I could get some demographics together for my presentation. So when I did my Shark Tank presentation, I could say, I've done some research. This is what the market looks like. This is how much they spend. This is how frequently they play, all that sort of stuff. And what happened was um, some of those US bingo sites found my website and contacted me and said, hey, Phil, can we advertise on your website? Now, my background previous to that was selling advertising space in magazines. So I'd sold advertising in the past. So these guys said, can we advertise on your website? I thought, yeah, OK, send me some money. I'll put some ads on the website. And that became the business. So it was totally accidental. Wow. Um, wasn't meant to be the business. Um, <laughs> you know, the cool kids might say, you know, I pivoted, but it, I can't. I can't say I pivoted. It was totally accidental. So I, I'm, you know, I'm hearing the story, and I'm going, oh my gosh, like how? What lessons did you learn, and how do you share those lessons from accidentally, you know, creating a, a, a wonderful, thriving business? Um, there's a number of lessons. I think that the, the main lesson that I picked up from it and I tell people all the time is is JFDI um you know Nike says just do it there's an f in the middle there just effing do it yeah, take the Don't opportunity freaking. just freaking do take, it <laughs> freaking yeah freaking that's the word yeah there yeah 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 there you go <laughs> and 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 looking back and and I had a huge sliding doors moment at that time because at the time we had two very young kids. I left this job. I had this idea that was getting no backing. And then suddenly this accident occurs. I was still looking for a job at the time. And I got offered a, a proper job. And I went in to see them on the Friday before the Monday I was due to start and said, I can't do it. I've got this thing that's, that's happening. And looking back, I think I looked at that and thought, well, OK, if this doesn't work, I'll back myself to get another job. And, and that's where the JFDI comes in. You know, in most instances, you know, unless you're, you're really betting the house on, on what you're doing, you know, we're not doing brain surgery. Nobody's going to die. Go for it. Because if you don't go for it, all you'll do is spend all your time thinking, oh, I wish I'd done that. But if you do well, go yeah. for it, and it, if you do go for it and it works, brilliant. If you do go for it and it doesn't work, you go, hey, it didn't work, but I did it, and I learned this and this and this and this and this. Um, and I think that was the key lesson I learned from from the accidental startup. Yeah, you know, I I did that a bit. The 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 just just do it, just go for it, just make it happen and try it. Uh, that sort of leap of faith of trying to make it happen uh, when I first started my business, and you know, it it worked for. A dozen years or so i was able to sell it and fantastic but there was a lot of like research that i did into that right like specifically like you know budget money finances um 
what do you recommend? Uh, Cause obviously we, I don't want to just give people, Hey, just do it. What's, what's the, what's the prep that they need to do to just do it? Yeah. I think the, 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 the key thing is understanding the market you're going into. And, and like you say, you do the research, you know, what's the potential out there? Who are my potential audience? What, you know, what's it going to cost to produce it? What's the profit margin going to be? What do projections look like? Uh, let's do a SWOT analysis on the whole market and, and this product. And where's our USP? And all the things we read in all the business books and we listen to in podcasts like this, where we teach people all that business stuff. And you can do all of that until you get to that point where you stood on the end of the cliff. Yeah. And we, mm-hmm. we, we, we have a saying here in the UK, um, and, and, and pardon the, pardon the, the old fashioned English here, but it's, it's a case of shit or get off the pot. And <laughs> at some point you get to that point. Right. And, right. and it's that leap of faith. And, and sometimes, sometimes you jump, and sometimes if you're lucky, you get a shove in the back. So there's, you know, many, many people who have started businesses because they got made redundant or something happened through something like COVID and, and they said, right, sod it, I'm going to try this thing I've been thinking of doing for ages. So, so that's like the shove in the back, which makes it easier to take that leap of faith or you just take that leap of faith. But I always say to people, you know, just ask the question, what's the worst that could happen? If you do take that leap of faith, what's the worst that could happen? You know, unless right. you're spending billions of dollars, unless you, like you say, like I say, you're putting the house on the market, unless you're really, 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 you know, going all in, there's usually a way out. So the upside is mm-hmm. so much bigger than the downside that you, it, it, it's, it's beneficial to do it. Yeah. And, at, you know, when I launched my business, I'm sure you, when you launch yours at the time, you think this isn't probably the cleverest thing I've ever done, but I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, right. And, and, right. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, with, all I, that, with all that being said, you know, and I love the attitude, just freaking do it. Is there ever a time where you tell them just freaking don't do this? I mean, this is a bad <laughs> idea. What do you what are you looking at, and what are you evaluating before you say don't do this? <laughs> I've got, I've, I've, <laughs> I've got a, a re- this is a real life example. I was approached a few months ago um, by a couple of ladies who have who have their own separate businesses, and between the two of them, they'd come up with a another business they wanted to do. So we sort of brainstormed it a bit and 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 they they took the leap of faith and jumped. And they came back to me about six weeks later and said, nobody's buying. Oh no, no, one person had bought and it was her sister. Um, mm-hmm. and this is where the business sounding board bits comes in. That at some point somebody has to say, Your baby's ugly. Yeah. This isn't gonna work. <laughs> and Right. What I often will talk and, and, and what worked with these two ladies particularly was because they had their own businesses, um, we f- I focused their minds on opportunity cost. So, you know, on Monday in my existing business, I can make, you know, insert a figure, $1,000, whatever the figure might be. But working on this new project, which is exciting and new and, and whatever, I'm losing money. And we do the same on Tuesday and we do the same on Wednesday. We do the same on Thursday. We do the same on Friday. And, uh, you know, and then you go, well, hang on a minute. Somebody's, you know, out there, the market is telling me this product isn't right. So I shouldn't do it. But also on the other hand, I'm actually losing money because I'm not doing my day job, my real business, which would make me, you know, a thousand dollars, 500 pounds, whatever the figure might be. But, Often, and and this is where the sounding board side of things comes in, people will say, oh, yeah, um, I get advice from my accountant, my solicitor, my brother, my father, my wife, my mates I go to the game with who've also got businesses. All of these people will usually have a subconscious bias within the advice that they may be giving best advice. Yeah. And they may mean it and they may believe they mean it when they're giving the advice. But, you know, I told these two ladies, don't do, you know, stop. Well, I didn't actually say stop doing it. I put enough 
pointers in front of them to, for them to go, yeah, you're right. Um, but, you know, will your husband or your wife say to you, do you know what, Greg? It's a brilliant idea, but you've got to jack it in. They, they won't because they don't want to hurt you. And your solicitor right. might think, actually, if I tell Greg to stop doing this, I've lost a client. Or your accountant will say, Russ, you know, carry on for six months because then you'll be able to pay my fees. And then, you know, <laughs> it might not be right. that overtly right. biased, but there is always a uh -huh. subconscious bias. That, yeah. and, 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 you know, I already mentioned Shark's Tank and somebody said this to me last week. Um, the best advice you get, the best business advice you get is if you watch something like America's Got Talent, when... I think, do you have Simon Cowell on your, your program? We yeah, we Simon do, says, you can't sing. You're terrible. You can't sing. But their, their mums and their dads and their husbands and their wives and their kids have said, oh, my God, you're brilliant. You're, 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 you're the next Kylie. And they go, no. So he's, he's the one saying, your baby's ugly. Mm -hmm. And some people haven't got that from their coach, their mentor, their sounding board to say, do you know what? Your idea yeah. sucks. Sometimes you have to do that. So that's the opposite of, of JFDI. Sometimes you have to say, sorry, it's not going to work. Yeah. Well, that's like uh, Gordon Ramsay going into all these uh, like hotels and restaurants and all that stuff too. Same thing. Yep. He destroys those people and they feel so bad, but it's like, well, this is what you should be hearing. I know it hurts, but it's, it, it is what and you should be hearing. It, so is, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say, what I, I I know it's TV and we're watching Gordon Ramsay taking these people apart. But, but even us who are not, you know, restaurateurs and experts, we can see the problems. Right. But the owner can't see. And that's exactly the same when you're advising other people. Often, you, you know, I'm not some brilliant marketing and, and business genius. I'm just looking from the outside in and go, uh, that's not very good. That's not a good idea. And that's not. And, and unless you have that person look at and everything I talk to my clients about has happened to me. In my business, I had external advisors, one of whom said to me, Phil, you're in the way of this business. Get out of the way of the business. But I couldn't see it because it's my business. Right. How do you know who to trust, though? When you're saying, when you're talking about this, you know, the, the bias that everyone has, how yeah. do you know who to trust? That's a, that's, Russ, that's a really good question. Um, I think on a on a, a simple basis that if you're going to get somebody from the outside in, so somebody who's not you know connected to you, I think it's got to be somebody who's been there, who's done it, who's got the battle scars, who's who sat there on a Sunday night thinking, "Geez, what you know, what am I going to tell the team on Monday?" All those sort of things. If, if you've got somebody who's been there and been through all those battles, they are usually a good advisor and particularly if they haven't got any vested interest in the business. So we you know, people get non-execs to, to help with their business. Well, the non-exec, even, even at that level has a vested interest. Obviously the non-exec wants the business to do well, um, but may not be the one to, you know, reusing that phrase, telling, telling somebody their baby's ugly. So if you've got somebody who's on one hand has got the experience and the battle scars to know what they're talking about, but is uninvested, so hasn't got that bias, that's going to be the best person to trust. Yeah, I always, you know, try to provide advice for businesses and they come to me and, and they're asking for, you know, me to be a sounding board for them. And the ones that I have the biggest challenge with, Bill, are the ones where there's either the product or the service is so innovative. It's cutting edge. It's something that, you know, very few or nobody has ever done before. And for those, it's really challenging for me because I don't know. It's like, it, it doesn't, it either sounds like a fantastic idea or maybe it doesn't sound like a very good idea. Like who would want that? But, you know, it's like, it's such, you know, when you're talking about a leap of faith, you're jumping into the waters and, you know, with no background as far as knowing what types of services before you have succeeded or not succeeded. Those are the ones that challenge me. Have you been faced with that before? And how would you deal with that? Um, I think, I think if you just go back to basics and, and, you know, I do, I do 
a little but not a lot of angel investing and and the way i look at things is okay what is what what problem does this product solve how does it solve it why is it better than the existing solution and, and why are you qualified to deliver that problem deliver that solution um and i think if all of those are in place then logic takes over and you go well yeah you know logically it should work um but what I try and do is I don't give uh, SME business owners solutions. I prod them and poke them and, and ask them questions that they, you know, they're the expert on you know, whatever it is they're selling or doing. And prodding and poking them to, to come up with the answer is the best way of doing it. So I'm not advising, I'm not saying do this, do that, do the other. I'm asking questions that lead them to go, oh yeah, I've never thought about that or you know, that might be a solution. I'll let, I'll, you know, I'll look into that or I hadn't considered that or that sort of thing. So you're not actually giving them the answer. They're finding it themselves. Um, so that gets you around the, the issue of, I don't understand what it is you're selling or doing <laughs> um, because, because you're getting them to do the thinking. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we've all got the same issues and the same problems. It's, you know, it's a sales issue. It's a marketing issue. It's a cash flow issue. It's a finance issue. It's staff, it's supply chain. They're all the same sort of problems. It's just they're dressed up differently in different sectors and, and, and different products. Now, what are the, the, the companies that you're advising? Uh, let, let's get specific into those, like some of those specific roadblocks that you see that yeah, most so, businesses so, have in common. Yeah, so as I, it's funny actually, because when I, when I first started, um, you know, we're all told, you know, you've got to create a customer avatar and, and target the avatar, which is great. So I thought, right, okay, my customer avatar is probably going to be my business hit around two million pound turnover. We had a dozen staff. We were in the online space and my background was advertising and marketing. So I thought, well, that's what I can best advise because that's what I know. And my first client was... Um, not online, was not an online product, uh, was multi-location and I was single location, had 120 staff and five million pound turnover. So completely, if you, this is my checkbox for my avatar and this is the checkbox for client number one. And what it showed me was that actually I could help any type of business. So my first business was a, was a chain of children's nurseries, okay? Um, okay. My second business that I advised was a, a publisher. The third business I advised um, actually was in the online gaming space with somebody I'd, who'd come through my sector. But across all of those, the first common point was, and this is where I think my customer avatar as a, as a coach, mentor, anybody else who's out there is, is possibly wrong, is when you're a business owner, inherently you will have a, a bit of an ego about you because you've gone, I can do better yeah. than that. I'm going to set up my own business. Yeah. So you've, yeah. Got, you've got to have a bit of an ego to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but with that ego, you then have the, well, I know best. And until those people have, have then got to the point where actually I've realized I don't know everything and I need some help that's when a coach or a mentor comes in place. And, and, I've, and I've found this the other way around. One of my angel investments, I thought, well, if I'm gonna do this coaching and mentoring business standing board for somebody, the first person I should do it with should be, should be an investment because it's, you know, it's my investment, I've got a benefit in it. So I went and you know, did the whole shooting match with him and he you know, nodded and said the right things and then didn't do any of the things we discussed. <laughs> now that might be because that might be because he thought I was talking a load of rubbish but I think what it was <laughs> looking back at it now is he wasn't in his headspace he wasn't ready to take on advice yeah. you see what I mean right. his ego I'm not, uh, and mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's a lovely fella he's a nice guy and he hasn't got a big ego but at the point at that point his ego was leave it with me I know what I'm doing I'm the expert you don't know what you're talking about right. um, so I think yeah, any, SM, any SME business owners who are listening to this or watching this, you know, they have to get to that point where they go, right, okay, I need some help. And until they get to that point, 
whether they fit into my client avatar or not is irrelevant. So the first point of, of the first point has to be they've got to the point where they go, I need some help. And I did that in my business journey three or four times. I put my hand up and said, I need some help from somewhere. And until you do that, you're not going to get any benefit from a coach or a mentor or a sounding board. Yeah, Russ and I deal with so many different business owners that think they need help. But they, like you said, they don't want to take the advice. They think yeah. they're the smartest guy in the room, right? And they just won't listen to anybody. Because, oh, no, no, you don't understand my business. You don't. Well, we do understand <laughs> business. And you're going down, you know, this path there. You can, you can probably uh, enhance it or improve it if you just took a little better look at it. You know, one of the things you had mentioned earlier about investors, and I'm really curious about this with your accidental bingo business. Is like you were pitching this to a bunch of people, you know, for investments, or, you know, backing. Like, what did they miss? Like, why didn't they get okay, the concept? Dude. Because it turned out to be extremely successful. What, what didn't they see? Or was it that you weren't explaining it properly so they didn't see it? Yeah, I think I've I've thought about this actually, um, and there, there was actually there's actually three reasons I think it it, it, it happened um, or it didn't happen. The first one was, um, it was around 2000, it was 2001 we were pitching, was just about the first dot-com oh. bubble bursting, oh. right? That was a tough so time. I'm there, yeah. pitching, I'm there pitching a dot-com business in the middle of a dot-com yeah. bubble burst, right? Yeah. So that's number one. That's not really a good idea. The second thing was, um, at the time, it was, a, it was a, 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 a legally gray area. It wasn't illegal but there wasn't, it wasn't legalized. So it was gray. It was like, mm, not sure about this. And the third reason was um, in the UK, we have two very big bing, land-based bingo chains. Um, and neither of those at the time were, I don't even think they were looking at online bingo. They, they, it wasn't on the horizon. Um, so the question was, well, these two big guys aren't doing it. So, why, you know, why do you think this is going to happen? And I think, you know, in many, many businesses, when you have a big, you know, monolith business, they don't, they don't see what's happening on the ground. You know, there's the classic story of blockbusters were offered Netflix and they, they went, right. nah, it's not going to work. Right. Um, and I, I think they were the three, the three reasons. And, 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 and in simple terms, I was too early to the market. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm some brilliant futurist. It just, I came across something, I got there early. I was too early, and sometimes you can be too early that people can't see the opportunity. Be, you know, often, often with these things, you know, nobody else is doing it, so why? And no, you know, nobody else is doing it, and the big boys aren't doing it either. Why is this going to work? So that that's why yeah. they all miss. It. It's, it's kind of like the scenario that I was explaining that you know it's so innovative at the time that mm -hmm. it's tough to it's tough to judge it's tough to understand it's tough to really understand what the future is yeah. of that type yeah. of product or service yeah yeah you know I, I, I've got like first of all you answered my my question before I even asked it about the uh, the business owner that won't take the advice because it's funny that you brought that up I was laughing because it's like oh yeah that's that's uh that's what we've all dealt with at some point. We 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 run across those, huh, Russ? <laughs> oh yeah, totally, totally. It's like we're trying to help you here, um, which makes me think about like you know I've been placed in that mentor role. I've had mentors, and I still have mentors. Like if I needed help on a business, I, I'm going to Greg. You know, like we're we've got people you know that we can lean on, but I've got people that are leaning on me. So now let's talk about that. At, like, as a mentor, you play a very important role here. And, you know, you don't want to give the biased advice. You want to, you know, give the most helpful advice and, and, and you know, help them to avoid whatever roadblocks they have in the future. Um, how do you do that? How do you ensure, like, the best outcome for people as, as a mentor to these businesses? Um, I think... <sighs> I think it's just, I mean, it's inherent in me as a person that I want to give best advice. And I, you know, I want, yeah. one of the things I do is I say to clients when they first start with me, um, I get them to pay up front and I say, at the end of our period together, if you haven't felt you've had benefit from it, I'll give you all your money back. No questions asked, no questions, whatever. So I have a financial incentive 
in myself to do that, but inherent in me to give my best advice. And and I think all you can do, and this is what this is this goes back to my point about people who've been there and done it and got the battle scars. I can give best advice best based on my experience and my experiences in business. Um, and I think you then got to just trust yourself to give best advice. And and it's interesting. You know, people are now looking back at, at what happened over COVID and all that sort of thing. And, and one of the one of the depending which side of the divide you're on, one of the excuses or one of the uh, reasons for some of the advice given was that was the best information we had at the time. And I think you can only do that as a business advisor. You know, if I was a business advisor ten years ago it probably wouldn't be as good as the advice I'd give five years ago. And my advice two years ago probably mm -hmm. isn't as good as the advice I'll give tomorrow because you're learning all the time. Yeah. You're learning, you're developing yourself and your skills. So you can only give best advice based on what you believe is best advice and you as a person wanting to give the best service you possibly can, particularly, particularly when you're a mentor because you are the brand. You know, it's yeah. easy sometimes to hide behind a brand um, but if people say, you know, my mentor was Russ, he sucked. It's, you know, the review, <laughs> the review is on, the review is on Russ. Yeah, it's not it's on a me. brand name, yeah. you know? Yeah. Right. And there's a bit of pressure that comes with that. You know, and there's like, I would say pressure and a bit of like the imposter syndrome type of thing of like, can I actually give this advice? Like, should I be giving this advice? Maybe you should be talking to somebody else. Like, I, you know, like you have those different feelings. And I feel like whenever I feel like that, when I ever feel like I'm questioning myself on advice, I tell them, <laughs> I'm like, well, this is what I would do, but let me give you these little asterisks here because I'm not totally sure. And you might want to consult a, you know, a professional like in that particular field to, to help answer those questions. That's what I always try to do. Uh, uh, Greg, how do you handle that? Cause you're, you, you've talked to, I don't know, every business in America uh, at this point. <laughs> Yeah, it's you know what it is, and I, I really you kind of led me perfectly into my next question with Phil is like I try to do as much research as possible prior to taking on as prior to giving advice because mm -hmm. you know if I don't if they're not perfectly in my sweet spot, you know I might have some blind spots and I need to kind of understand where those blind spots are and and familiarize myself as much as possible with you know whatever industry that are, you know we're talking about. And mm -hmm. um, so I try to do a lot of research. And if, you know, I have mentors as well, sometimes I'll go to my mentors and ask them, yeah. it's like, okay, what do you know about this? And, you know, yeah. this is the situation that, that, you know, I'm being faced with, with a potential client. Should I even take this on? You know, a lot of things go into the preparation before I'll talk to somebody and, you know, feel confident about the advice that I would be providing. So, Phil, I was curious, you know, what type of research do you put in prior to uh, taking on a new client? Um, before I answer that, just to go back to something Russ just said um, about imposter syndrome. When I, when I, after I sold my business, um, I sat down with a friend of mine who is also a business coach. And I said, you know, I don't know what I want to do. And he said, you should be a business coach. And I said, who's going to listen to me? You know, I was making it up as I go along and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> And I had throughout my business career, not only when I was running my own business, but throughout my business, I suffered with imposter syndrome. Um, and as an aside, if you want, if you want a guest to talk about imposter syndrome, I know I, I've interviewed the UK's number one expert on it, and I'll give her your details. Mm. She's fantastic. Um, but going back to go back show. to what you were saying, Greg, um, there's a there's a pro and a con to what you just said in terms of research because. The person you're advising, they're the expert on, on their company, their business, their sector. You're the expert, you, me, Russ, whoever else. We're the expert on coaching mm -hmm. and mentoring. So we're not there to give them advice on you know, technology the for their example, sector or yeah. their product. Um, and sometimes it's a benefit not to understand an industry because you can, yeah, classic question, you know, why do you do it like that? Because us looking on the outside in, we go, hey, that's dumb. You know, why do you do that? And usually it's, you, you know what the usual answer is, don't you? Mm -hmm. We always do it like that. That's how we do it in this industry. Right. That's no 
Because it's always been. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or I did it in the company I was employed in and now I'm running my own business. That's the way I do it. So actually not understanding and not knowing a business and not knowing a sector sometimes gives you the advantage of actually saying, just having the, just almost the stupidity to go, why'd you do that? Right. Whereas somebody who's in the sector wouldn't question that because that's the way the sector does it. Right. So okay, in now, answer, now in answer to your the, question, I, we'll use another slogan question, there. I tend not to do a lot of research. Sorry, say that again, Russ. Oh, I was going to say another another thing. Think different, right? Like that. That's really like the you know. So now we've got just do it and think different. We're put, pulling in all of the uh, different <laughs> yeah. slogans there, but that that's very true. I mean, it, like when you're approaching it in a different way and coming at it from the outside, like really, like every industry does experience the same issues. You know, like like you were saying earlier, it's finance, it's marketing, it's sales, it's you know whatever. So it, it is all you know very similar. So, okay, so no research into that industry, into that business. What, what's the no research? What, what are you not researching? I will, I, you know, if, if a client approaches me, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have a discovery call like, like you would with any client. Um, and if they say, yeah, let's go for it, you know, I'll, I'll look over their website. I'll check them out on LinkedIn. I'll, you know, may fall down a couple of rabbit holes, but I won't do a big, you know, understanding of the sector because it depends what the client going back to what i said right at the start mm -hmm. it depends what the client says when they say um what i want to do in a year's time because if it's right. you know i want to sell the business do you really need to understand the sector yeah you might you might need to understand who the major players are but the concept of selling right. your business is pretty straightforward isn't it? get you get your numbers in place i've actually written a long article about that um there's, you know, there's loads of basics you would put in place to sell your business, irrelevant of which sector your business is in. And if they said, you know, we want to we want to hit five million dollar sales and we're currently on two, then the solutions are pretty, you know, are going to be fairly similar. You know, get yourself a bigger sales team, you know, expand your product range, up your up your prices, reduce your costs. You know, they're all the same same issues and the same solutions the sector m may may not make a difference so so i tend to not get too deep into a sector because it just depends where we're going to go with whatever the client's going to discuss okay well well phil if any of our listeners uh is looking for a sounding board what's the best way for them to reach out to you Okay, the best place to find me is uh, on my website, which is www.philfraser.co.uk. Uh, don't go to philfraser.com because that's a medieval costume company. So if you see pictures of people <laughs> like Robin Hood and that sort of thing, you're in the wrong place. You're say it's philfraser.co.uk. It's actually those who are watching, it's on the screen. Or look me up on LinkedIn and you know, happy to have a chat with anybody who needs any help, you know, no cost, just drop me an email, do send me a DM through LinkedIn and I'm happy to help. And we have listeners awesome. all over the world. Are you taking on clients everywhere? Wherever you want. All right. All right. Awesome. Well, Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure being here. Hope you enjoyed it. Oh, we no did. Problem. No problem. I appreciate I, it. I got all, I got all kinds of random notifications in my ear. That's that, that was the, uh, the the look of what what is happening here. Um, <laughs> we've we've got another interview, Greg, and I got a Giants game to get to. So uh, <laughs> thank you all for listening, subscribing, and reviewing DIY for Business on whatever platform you're listening to this on a uh, podcast platform or over on YouTube. And Greg, I've got some exciting news for you. This is What's like. That? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm breaking news for you that uh, you you don't know. All of our old episodes of DIY for Business have been moved also over to YouTube now. So if you go over to YouTube, you can catch up on every single episode all the way back to the really bad ones that we did when we weren't good at this uh, <laughs> <laughs> till now. So uh, uh, check those out on our uh, YouTube account. Uh, we'll throw some links in the description uh, to get you over to that. Uh, all the information provided uh, is opinion-based and you might want to consult a professional to discuss your exact business situation. Greg and I want your company to succeed and we are happy to take your questions. We'd also love to hear your suggestions for future episodes. If there's something where you need some solid business advice or help, let us know. 
and might be able to build an entire episode around it. You can reach out to us uh, by sending us a direct message over on Twitter or just, you know, at whatever platform you're on, throw something on there. Uh, we're, we're pretty responsive, uh, so, as, as we should be. Uh, we also uh, love talking to business owners, so if you'd like to join us uh, on a future episode, just you know, discuss your business and look. let's talk about your situation, uh, reach out to us as well. Uh, we thank you again for listening and subscribing to DIY for Business, where you are not alone.